Uh, we are, this is our fourth Sunday in this series from Passover to Pentecost. We are, um, as we talked about it earlier in the first service, this is actually closer to ascension because after the 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he went back to heaven as well. And um, that's actually during this time. We're just going to get to the beginning of that this morning. But we are in the series from Passover to Pentecost. And this morning we're going to be going in a slightly different direction. But I invite you, stay with me. Um, and as we, as we look at how the Lord is leading us in, these, uh, in this message this morning, next week will be our last as we celebrate the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in answer to the promise that Jesus gave. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit is one of the proofs. You know, we've been talking about the various proofs. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit is one of the proofs that Jesus raised from the dead and returned to heaven. Because he told them, he said, when I return to the Father, he and I will pour out the Holy Spirit. And he did that. And he is still doing that in our hearts and in our lives today. So we looked at this, remember, from Acts 1-3. Here's our theme verse again, these convincing proofs appearing to them, speaking about the kingdom of God. If you have your Bibles, you can look at the verse right before that in Acts 1, verse 2, because in Acts 1, verse 2, it says, He gave further instructions to his apostles through the Holy Spirit. And all the time before this, uh, Jesus, this is not mentioned, that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus did this. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus te was teaching. Although certainly he was, because Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit and was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was water baptized by John. But now in his glorified state, as he is preparing his disciples, who are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit in salvation, for what is yet ahead, which is the filling of the Holy Spirit to equip them and to equip you and me to do what he has called us to do, to be what he has called us to be. As Reinhard Bonnke said in that earlier clip, we are not meant to do this on our own. We are not meant to be this on our own. If we do, if we try, we are miserable failures, are we not? Miserable failures. But Jesus and God the Father have sent the Holy Spirit, pouring him out in baptism and in filling that we might be overcomers, that we might be his message bearers, that we might be his witnesses in a world that is opposed to him, in a world that is broken and messed up and that needs him so desperately. And the only way, the only way the world around us and the people around us will hear is through the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in us and through us. That's the only way. That's the only way. And so Jesus taught his disciples further and he prepared them for the time. So we're going to talk this morning about food for a while. We're going to talk about meals this morning, and you're going to hear a few things at the beginning that I'll bet you never thought you would hear in a message, at least not at Lighthouse. Today's a really special day. Do you know what today is besides being Sunday, Ascension Sunday? Today is International Pickle Day. Did you know that? So if you're going for a meal after, uh, after uh, service, Maybe you could order pickles and sit around and fellowship over a meal of pickles. Maybe you missed what came earlier this week. Uh, yesterday was National Chocolate Chip Day. Sorry, it's an, it's an American thing. Um, I do apologize, but don't get too hung up on American thing because are we not, during the Chun'ung Festival, going to celebrate by eating zhongzi? These dumplings all wrapped up in leaves. We certainly are. We certainly are. So it's not just a Western thing, is it? It's in it's these meals, these gatherings are in every culture. Uh, you may have missed two day, three days ago, International Hummus Day. For those of you who love hummus, I, I am one of those. And coming up this Friday is National Pizza Party Day. So 
put it on your calendars, parent, especially parents that, that have kids. Prepare for, for National Pizza Day. And then, uh, I am so sorry to tell you, I know some of you will truly be heartbroken, the um, International Balut Festival in, uh, in outside of Manila, in Taguig, Taguig? Taguig was canceled because of COVID this year. I'm really, I'm really sorry about that. We do, we do apologize. However, we can make up for it on July 7th when we have Chocolate Day. <laughs> so, um, so as, as we think about it, and that's just a, a humorous opening as we, as we go into it. Food is important to us, isn't it? Um, and, and you think about that. Uh, how many, think about how the Lord, when he made us, God, when he made us, made us to enjoy food, how much we enjoy it. We do. We love food, don't we? Uh, it's not just something for most of us. It's not just something that fills our stomachs and, and stops our hunger, but it's something that in which we take pleasure. For me, uh, uh, when Sister Betty was here in Hong Kong, she and I would um, quite regularly, we would go out to, we'd go out to eat together and with, with others as well. And when Betty went back to the U.S., I had a huge, huge adjustment. Um, I, I was quite happy to live alone. Um, and I'm sure Betty is happy to live alone as well. We're both, we're both strong characters, but we were happy living together as well, and the Lord brought us together. But my huge adjustment, truly the biggest adjustment I had, was during the week, if... I wanted to go out and eat. And I don't say this in a pitiful way, but some of you would recognize this and you would understand this. I'll bet Steve understands this, but even more so, even more so um, than for me. It was just the, the weird is not the right word. It was just the most uncomfortable thing to think about. And Sister Lisa, you would understand that as well. Those of us that have been partners in some way with someone else and, then, and now are no longer partners in that way. And it was just... It was a difficult thing. In fact, for months, I just didn't go out to eat because it felt so strange. I felt so uncomfortable. I felt in a restaurant that people were just looking at me like this person sitting there all alone. And even when I started doing it, I would sit there and I would just rush through my food and I didn't enjoy the meal because I just felt so out of sorts, if that makes sense. Those of you, those of you that have not experienced that, it, sorry, it's, I'm not really able to explain it so very well, but it was, it made me realize that meals and food are not, are, let me say meals, are not just about food, are they? Meals are about fellowship, aren't they? Meals are about fellowship. How many of us at a meal, uh, oh, by the way, you don't have to now say, oh, I must invite Pastor Jennifer out to eat because she's all alone. I am so used to it now. I am perfectly content going out to eat all by myself. The food tastes great. I take my time. I look at my phone. I sit there quietly. Um, but, but if you want to invite me, that's okay, too. <laughs> but what I, what I realized is God, in making us for food and food for us, also made us so that this time is a time not just of putting sustenance in our bodies, but in the act of eating together, we slow down. In the act of sharing a meal, I get to know you better. You get to know me better. In the act of eating, sharing food, talking about the food, bonds are built. Friendships and relationships are strengthened. This is true in families. This is true in church. And it's one of the things I truly, I love about Lighthouse. And it's something that I have missed seeing so much during these restrictions with COVID when some people are still remaining online only. But we want you back. We want you back. Or when restaurants were not so open. And it just almost, though we would have a great Sunday together, at times it almost seemed like our Sundays were not really complete, right? Remember that for that time when, when we couldn't, it was just two to a table or things like that. And I was thinking about that. And today I want us to talk for a little while about a meal with Jesus. A meal with Jesus. As important as meals are to us in our 21st century uh, society, mealtimes were even more important in the culture of Jesus and in the day of Jesus. And it is no surprise, if you look 
at the 50 days, or let me say 40 days, because uh, 10 days before Pentecost, Jesus returned to heaven. But in these 40 days that Jesus met with his disciples, in the eight mentions um, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the gospel and, and the book of Acts, that at least half the times Jesus is with them, fellowshipping, and significant sharing and friendship and teaching and things are happening over a meal, over a meal. And I don't think that's by chance. I believe it is completely by design. If we follow the church after the day of Pentecost, do you know what we will see? You can look on your own. And in fact, I hope, I hope that you will on your own uh, look and read through these early chapters of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, about the church after the day of Pentecost, we read that there were four things that the church devoted themselves to. Really big things like teaching, prayer. Do you know what the other two things are? that don't seem so particularly spiritual, but this is what they devoted themselves to. This is what Luke is inspired to note for you and for me. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to fellowship. And so I'm so glad you are here this morning. And I want to say something to those of you that have been away for various reasons. I'm especially glad to see your faces. I can't see them smiling yet because we're still with masks, but so glad to see you. And I just want to say, those of you who are still a little bit um, that are slow to return with us in person, we want you back. We want you back. We want to fellowship with you. That's part of church. That's part of the family of God. And so fellowship was one of the other things. And the final thing that was highlighted, that was important for the early church was, believe it or not, eating together. Go figure Think about that. It's important enough that it's one of the four main things the church did as they were filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of God and were infused and on fire from the Holy Spirit. One of the things their hearts desired was to have meals together. It was Jesus himself who instituted the Last Supper. And so I want us to look at that in these last 40 days in light of that. And this one you've seen before. This one is so familiar to us. Here's the first meal that we look at. And this was for the disciples as they were going on the road to Emmaus. So they're walking along. And I want you to see with me. So they're walking and they're talking. We already know that later on they say our hearts were burning within us. So here's Jesus walking with them as they are going about their business. We don't know what their business was, but we know that it wasn't exercise. They had business, right? This was part of their routine. And I want to encourage you, what that says to me is that Jesus is with you as you go about your routine as well. As well, Jesus is with you in your work. Jesus is with you in the things that you do day by day by day. And their hearts burned within him, within them as he spoke to them. But go further with me. He's going to go on, but they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with him. And I want us to see something here this morning, brothers and sisters, because as we know, they eat together, right? That's what comes next. And it was the end of the day. And I want us to see what they received because they urged Jesus to stay with them. I want us to see what Jesus revealed to them and showed because they said, come near, eat with us. Let's fellowship together over the table. Jesus is always waiting for that invitation, brothers and sisters. Is he with you? Yes, of course he's with you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But how many of us know that there is another level, a greater intimacy, a greater openness when you and I slow down when you and I set aside the things that I need to do because I'm really busy and I've got this and I've got that and instead I say and I urge Jesus Jesus stay with me stay stay let's let's spend some time together even though they don't know it's the master this is what they do and so as we see It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, he blessed it, 
and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. Then their eyes were open. These disciples were not there on the night of the Last Supper when Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. But there was another time when they were there, weren't they? Remember when Jesus took the bread and the fish, blessed it, broke it, and fed 5,000 people. Another time when he fed 4,000 in a similar manner. And I'm sure that echoed in their minds. There was something there. There was something miraculous. Then their eyes were open. And I want us to see, brothers and sisters, that there is a revelation of Jesus. There is a revelation to you in your heart and in your life of Jesus not just in the day-to-day -day as Jesus is with us, because surely he is with us, but beyond that, as we urge him, as we make space, as we make place, as we make time for him. Jesus, I want to spend time with you. And in that making place, in that meal, if you will, with Jesus, is when, what? Just as the disciples, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is what Jesus wants. This is what Jesus offers. And it comes when you and I make space. Jesus will never push you. He'll never say, now come on, I want to show I love you. He never does that. But he waits for you. And he waits for me to open the door. Jesus. I, I told the first service, um, you know, I try to climb the mountain every day if I'm working at home. And I usually do it end of day because it's getting so, so hot these days. And I always have my phone with me. I don't want to be without it as I'm going, you know, on, on a mountain trail or whatever. And I'd gotten in the habit of getting to the top and then, because I'm really hot and sweaty, um, I sit down for a while and just look out. And it's a beautiful spot. It's really high. The valley and then the clouds are rolling in. And there's usually a cool early evening breeze by this time. Birds are singing. I mean, it really sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But... I had gotten in the habit of getting to the top and instead of enjoying what Jesus had given me and time with Jesus, what I had started doing was as soon as I'd sit down, out would come my cell phone and I'd start catching up because by then it'd be about 5, 30, 6 o'clock. How many COVID cases today? What's happening? You know, this and that or whatever. How many of you know your schedule is kind of the same way sometimes, right? And I, the Holy Spirit began convicting me this week as I realized I was missing precious time with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with looking at our phones. There's nothing wrong with that. But how many times do, do things like this dominate our lives and steal from us, steal from us the meal that Jesus would like to have with us where he can show himself to us in a special and in a new, in a new way. And I think that is part of what this story is with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It goes a little bit further. They go running back. Uh, these two, uh, we don't know how long it takes them, but I'll bet they returned faster than they left, right? It was about seven or eight miles from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. I'm guessing that they could have made it maybe in an hour and a half, maybe. That, that's what I think. I think they were pretty excited to go back. They go into the room that's closed. This is when Jesus appears, but just before, look with me at these words, beautifully described. Um, this is an exact uh, description. It's a little bit better than the New Living Translation or the NIV. Look with me. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and look with me, how he was what? What does it say? How he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. What evocative words for us. That is where he was made known. That's when you slow down. That's when you're together. When you eat a meal with someone, you're not 10 feet apart, are you? You're face to face, aren't you? You're up close. And this is what, here's a physical example for us. But brothers and sisters, spiritually, this is what Jesus wants for us. This is what Jesus longs for with us. You know, ha have you thought about this before? Why? Really? Why should Jesus appear to these two disciples that we don't know much about? Wasn't it enough? I can understand Mary Magdalene. She's in the garden I, I can understand Peter because he'd blown it so badly. And of course, to the disciples that night in the room, who cares about these two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Sooner or later, they would have heard Jesus has, been risen, has risen from the dead. Nevertheless, sovereign God designed and planned 
that Jesus would just walk along beside them in their day to day and that Jesus would show himself over a meal. May we learn from this meal with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then we know the next meal, although it can hardly count as a meal. What's the very next meal that's mentioned? This, this, may, this may kind of trip you up a little bit because, like I said, it hardly seems like a meal. What, let me put it this way. What's the next mention of food? Here we go. Luke, what does it say? And we read while they, they, Jesus appears and then he asks them, do you have anything here to eat? So they were eating together. Now, I agree with you. And then he took some broiled fish. But that had to be an incredibly, at least on their part, what a, what a weird, uh, weird's not the right word, but perhaps what an awkward moment. How many of you, as, a, as I've used the example before, have you ever gone out to eat with a group, group of people and your food came first, right? And everybody else is sitting at the table and you're looking at your food, right? But you're really polite, so you're not going to start on your food first, right? But you're looking at it, and the longer it goes, the longer it goes, you're looking at your food, and it's getting cold. And if you got pasta, it's sticking together now, right? And you're sitting there because you're really polite. And finally, somebody at the table says, oh, go ahead and eat. Our food is coming soon. Don't let it get cold. And you uh, eagerly and yet reluctantly dive into your food, right? How awkward is it to be sitting there, the only one eating at the table, while everybody is waiting for their food and kind of looking at, looking at you. And then you want to share, right? You say, here, want some? Oh, no, 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 mine's coming soon. It's such an awkward thing. I imagine, think with me as we've talked about, what must it have been like that night? Now, I don't think Jesus found it awkward, but I'll bet that chewing of that broiled fish, as they looked, what's going to happen? Is it going to drop through his body? How is he a ghost or is he not? Um, and yet, this is the, this meal, if you will, Jesus included it in the scriptures. This is part of it still as one of those proofs to show I am real. I, I am alive. And it was at this meeting, it was at this gathering, it was at this meal that Jesus breathes on them and says what? Receive the Holy Spirit in regeneration, in new birth for the first time since first Adam and first Eve. I'm not going to spend long on that one because we already, we've gone through that one and there's not as much for us in that one. But I do want to look at the next meal. What's the very next meal that's mentioned? To me, it's the most, along with the road to Emmaus meal, that, that meal and this meal are the two most heartwarming and most instructive for us. Jesus told his disciples what? He said, go ahead of me into Galilee, and I'll meet you in Galilee, and I'll meet you on a mountain in Galilee. And so we find this part, this next meal in John, we find it in John chapter 21. Remember what we said? Last chapter of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us all about the, the resurrection, post-resurrection appearances, and the last two chapters in John, first chapter of Acts. And so here we see this meal. And I, I asked in the first service, so I'm going to ask you to moms, especially, because that's usually who it happens for moms. How many of you, or maybe wives, how many of you have ever been served breakfast in bed? Pitiful, pit, uh, pitiful. Panina has, because she already told us in the first service. But she agreed, as I have thought about it. It's a most uncomfortable meal, isn't it? You're afraid you're going to knock over your milk. What if you spill something on the bed? Then who's going to wash the who's going to wash the sheets? You are, right? Mom's going to wash the sheets. Breakfast in bed is, I think, maybe not such a great thing. But breakfast by the Sea of Galilee with Jesus is special indeed. And this is how it comes about. Look with me. You know this story so well. They've gone back up to Galilee because Jesus said, go up there and I'm going to meet you there. Probably because it was out of the view of the authorities. Probably because that was his home area. Many disciples would have been there. Um, Paul later says he appeared to 500 people. Probably this is when. It's probably in Galilee, though we don't know for sure. But anyhow, they are up there. Um, the disciples are there. Are all of them at this breakfast? No, not all of them are at this breakfast. But who is there at this breakfast? Several of them were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and the sons of Zebedee. Who are the sons of Zebedee? 
James and John, right? The sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. We don't know who the other two disciples are, but perhaps Andrew, because he's also a fisherman, right? And Peter says, I'm going, whoops, sorry. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. Why? They have to eat. They have to, they have to live. Jesus has been appearing and disappearing, but Jesus has already been telling them um, he's going to go and he's going to leave them. So in a way, it sort of, it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, well, what are we going to do next? I w- I've got to eat. And so he says, I'm going fishing. Um, Peter's leadership skills were great. Peter's direction was not always so great. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. So this gives us the setup for the meal that is coming next. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. In just a few verses, we'll read that he was about a, a, hun- a hundred yards, hundred plus meters out in the lake. It was very early in the morning, so maybe the, co- the light is not very bright yet. And they don't recognize that it's Jesus, even though he talks with them. Is it just because of natural things? It may be, but it may also be there's a spiritual aspect to it as well. The disciples couldn't see who he was. And then he called out to them, fellows, do you have any? Sorry, let me put it this way. You don't have any fish, do you? Now that makes sense to us. Jesus knew they didn't have any fish, didn't he? He knew that because he was going to do something. He was going to work a miracle. He was going to work a miracle very similar to the miracle that he worked when he first called them. Do you see the significance and the importance of this time and of this meal? He's getting ready to leave them. In the beginning, he said, hey, Come with me. I'll make you fishers of men. Remember that? They're by, the, they're by the ocean. He says, here, push out deeper. Not ocean, Galilee, sea, lake. Push out and to the deeper water, and you'll catch fish. And Peter says, well, if you say so, uh, but you're a rabbi, and I'm a fisherman. But he does it nevertheless. They catch fish, and it's the, so many fish, that the nets are breaking. And remember, when, we, when you see that, let me see if I can... There, it's in Luke. We worked hard all night. They shout, a shout for help brought their partners. Who are their partners? James and John, right? James and John are their partners. Look with me at this. In this miracle, what does Simon realize? He realized what had happened, and there was a revelation, a beginning revelation. Jesus is from heaven. Jesus is holy, and I am not. I am not, and he sees in that. He sees in that the miracle. And so this was at the beginning. But now this is at the end because Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. What are these disciples going to do? Jesus said, follow me. But how are they going to follow him? Because a few days after this, they're not going to see him anymore. And so who are they going to follow? How are they going to follow? What are they going to follow? And it is the same question, brothers and sisters, for you and for me as well. So Jesus says, you don't have any fish, do you? He knows what he's going to do already. He knows they don't have any fish, even though he's 100 yards from the shore and it's early morning because he's Jesus, because he's Jesus. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when Jesus asks you something, do you know that he never asks to get information? He already knows. It's to do something in our thinking and to do something in our hearts, isn't it? And they reply, I like this. Look, how, look, look at their reply. Don't be too hard on them. You would think the same way. What is, hey, you haven't caught any fish, have you? What do they reply? No. We don't like that answer, do we? But we're the same way it's at, sometimes. And then he said, throw your net out on the right hand and you'll get some. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish. And so as we look at this, what happens next? Therefore, the disciple, John, the one whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And he's reminded of that first miracle, right? When the nets were almost breaking from fish. And when it happens again, John realizes. Do You know what? If you look at the scriptures, if you look at the gospels, you will see that almost always of all of the disciples, John receives revelation first. I think it had something to do with his heart and his closeness to Jesus. Peter almost always acted first, but John almost always had revelation first. And John is the one who turns to Peter. He says, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Now, what does Peter do? I love this so much. It really, 
it really helps me see that it's Peter. What does he? Peter says, <coughs> excuse me, it's the Lord. And so Peter is wearing, the best way to say it is he's wearing his underwear. That, that's the best way to say it. Because they're fishing, right? Now, we're laughing, we think. But now, before you laugh too much at this, how many of you would want to appear before Jesus in your underwear? You, you, you know what I mean. And so Peter grabs his cloak, his robe. This is how we know it's Peter. He, gra- he grabs it, he puts it on, because you've got to wear clothes to meet Jesus, right? And then what does he do? He jumps in the water, gets completely wet, and swims all the way to, to land. Wouldn't you think that he would take his clothes and swim like this all the way to the shore and then put his clothes on? But no, Peter, impulsive as always. And you know, brothers and sisters, I think Jesus loves you as you are. Are there things that Jesus wants to change and is going to change in you? Sure, there are. But you know what? Just as he loved John, that gentle disciple who leaned close to him, who was so close to him, he just as surely loved impulsive, loudmouth Peter as he was as well. And so they arrive. The others stay with the boat. I would have been upset with Peter because they have to do the hard work. They pull the net to the shore. They're about 100 yards out. And now here we come to the meal. And this is what I want us to see as we look at this. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Here's the meal. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. And I want us to see this. And this is where we will. I'm just looking at the time. We may not get to the last meal. Maybe we're going to do the last meal next week. The last meal is the meal that he eats just before he goes to heaven. He's eating with them and he says, wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait here. And then he goes back to heaven and he prepares them. But in this meal, with this charcoal fire, Think with me about this. Where did Jesus get that fish? And where did Jesus get that bread? It's at dawn and it's fresh fish. Where did Jesus get it? You think he went to a store to buy it? Of course not. He's Jesus, right? He's Jesus. And he has bread and he has fish waiting for, him, for them. And I want, I want you to see the mundane and the miraculous in this. Were they hungry? Those of you who have teenage kids will tell you or maybe before they're hungry, uh, they can play for 30 minutes and they'll come in and they'll say, I'm starving, right? But how many of you can work for 12 hours through the night as these fishermen disciples did and not be hungry? We'd all be hungry. And so there's the mundane and Jesus meets their needs. There's bread and there's fish on a charcoal fire on a very cold morning, besides which Peter was wet. So to get by the fire and to warm. And there's bread and there's fish there. How inviting it must have been. How warming it must have been. How fulfilling for their stomachs it must have been. But want us to see what else is part of that. Jesus says, bring some of the fish you've just caught. And so they drag it aboard. 153 large fish, but the net had not torn. And I want you to see, brothers and sisters, that Jesus always does his miraculous part. But with it, He takes our very natural part. They went out and they caught fish and they had to drag those nets full of fish back to the shore. And Jesus says, bring the fish that you caught. And it's married with the fish that Jesus provided, the miraculous and the mundane. But there's more miraculous here than we know, because as we read it, what do we say? Jesus invites them, come and have some breakfast. They knew it was Jesus And then he served them the bread and the fish. Here's the other miracle of this. We don't read Greek, but if we did, we would see that this says, Jesus took the fish, singular, that was on the coals, and he took the bread, singular, that was there. He took it and he gave it to them. How can one fish... How can one piece of bread feed seven hungry men? In the hands of Jesus, everything can be multiplied. In the hands of Jesus, your limited resources, your weakest efforts in his hands can bring a miracle to many. And that's what we see in this meal. But there's one more thing that we see in this meal because there's still some unfinished business. 
Peter is there. He was the first one. He jumped out of the boat. He swam to Jesus. He wanted to get close to him. And as he's standing around the charcoal fire, warming himself and eating, there's one other piece of business that has to be dealt with. Because this charcoal fire, this word, this expression, is a very special word. Do you know that this only occurs two times in the whole Bible, this expression, charcoal fire, in the Greek? It only occurs two times. One time is right here. Do you know when the other time is? Go back just a few chapters. And John uses this expression again. And John was there the first time as well. And the only other time a charcoal fire, exactly these words are mentioned, is when Peter stood by a charcoal fire in a cold night, warming himself while his master, Jesus, was being unjustly tried and accused. John was there also. And it was by that charcoal fire that Peter, I don't know him, publicly, swearing three times. And so at this meal, there's still unfinished business. It's not coincidence, brothers and sisters, that this charcoal fire, that he's inspired to use these words again. Because after they've eaten, Jesus says, Simon, Peter, do you love me? Ouch. Now remember, Jesus never asks us a question to get information. He already knows. And how many times does Jesus ask Peter? Does he take him off to the side so that they can have a private conversation? No, he does it with the other disciples. Why? Because Jesus is being mean? Because Jesus is going to rub his nose in it? Because I'm going to get you back because you denied me after all I've done for you? None of these things. Jesus is not like that. But there is unfinished business. And brothers and sisters, Jesus always takes care of unfinished business. You and I would like to move on from unpleasant, unfinished business, wouldn't we? Of course we would. We'd like to move on. But Jesus doesn't. Why? Because Jesus has to get Peter ready for the next meal when he says, wait here, I'm giving the Holy Spirit, you're going to go out and tell the world about me. But if there is unfinished business in Peter's life and in the hearts and the thoughts of the other disciples, Peter will never be who Jesus wants him to be. Peter will never do what Jesus wants him to do. And it is no different with you and with me, brothers and sisters. It is exactly the same with each one of us. And if there is unfinished business in your heart and in your life, don't keep going forward trying to leave it in the past. Meet Jesus at your charcoal fire and let him deal with that so that he can keep you going in the direction that he has for you. I love the way this ends. He asks him a third time. And Peter was grieved. Oh, Jesus, you know all things. You know I love you. I'm so encouraged by that little expression that Peter says to Jesus. And it encourages me because it lets me know that even when I don't get it right, Jesus still loves me. It lets me know That even when I mess up sometimes and I have to get things right, Jesus still loves me. I may get judged by other people. I may be accused by other people. I may be condemned, but Jesus still loves me. And Peter says, Master, you know all things. You know that I love you. And I want to encourage you this morning. If you have not done so well in a particular area, it does not mean that you don't love Jesus. It does not mean that. But Jesus does want to take care of it. Jesus does want to handle it so that you and I can keep on going in the way that he wants us to. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's the second one. I'm going to let you look at that on your own because we do have to stop this morning. This is the very last meal. We always talk about the Last Supper in the the upper room. But you know what? This is really 
It's not a supper. This is probably around lunchtime because because they can see him rising in heaven and the sky's not dark. So maybe maybe it's a midday, sometime in, in, in the light. And this is the last meal that Jesus has with them. Is it not heartwarming? Is it not encouraging to know that they were with him at that meal and Jesus chose to gather them together around a meal and then say, Holy Spirit's coming. Here's my commission to you. Go into all the world. That was done at this meal. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's this meal. That's this meal. And then he leads them out and he blesses them and he returns to heaven. Oh, let us not miss meals with Jesus, brothers and sisters, because he's got something special for you in that meal. He's got something special for me in that meal. I trust God has spoken to your heart this morning in these meals that we've looked at. A meal with Jesus. A meal with Jesus. Take time this week. Give Jesus some time. Give him a meal. Give him a meal. And just say, I I really, that's such a, a vivid, just give him a meal. You're close to him. You're across the table from him. You're sharing something with him. And he will show himself to you. And he'll do the things that need to be done. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you do invite us. You're the host. And we come to you. May we give you time this week. We do love you, even in our weakness, even in our shortcomings. We do. And and Jesus, right now, we say, as Peter said, Oh, Jesus, you know everything. You know I love you. You know I love you. And you accepted that. And you agreed. And you accept us also. May we walk with you this week and may we eat with you this week and spend time with you this week, not on our schedule, but on yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great week. I am praying for you each day. Each day. We love you.